In the hours following the long-awaited merge, over 40% of the network's transactions were added by just two entities, Coinbase and Lido. It's worth noting that this is, in a lot of ways, analogous to mining pools seen in proof-of-work blockchains like Bitcoin and, until recently, Ethereum. But there are a couple of important differences that I think are worth kind of getting into. Mining pools are basically services where miners join together to have many smaller mining operations become one larger one, increasing the chances of finding a new block and earning the reward, which is then split between the participants based on how much their hardware contributed to the power of the group. A smart contract like Lido or a company like Coinbase does essentially the same thing. But instead of the power of a miner's hardware, it's the user's number of tokens that matters. And here's where that's different. A mining pool does not hold a miner's hardware. The miner simply points their power at the pool, and they can, without any involvement from the pool, change where that power goes or simply turn it off at a moment's notice. And there's really nothing the pool can do about it. With proof of stake, though, the tokens that represent a user's participation must be held by the smart contract or company, which then adds it together into one big pile of tokens. A simple way to think about this is that mining pools are essentially non-custodial, while their proof of stake equivalent needs to hold your tokens to work. And that's a distinction without a difference when times are good. But should a company like Coinbase fail, have their security compromised, be the subject of sanctions or any number of other problems, not to mention the risk of smart contracts simply just having a flaw in them that hasn't yet been discovered, users staking with that service could find their coins trapped until and assuming the problem is resolved. Personally, I have no skin in the game here. I prefer a diversity of approaches, but I think it's a fascinating and poorly understood risk and an important distinction between Ethereum's old proof-of-work approach versus this new proof-of-stake one. Well, as someone who's in the trenches from the world of mining, which now seems like it's a little obsolete when we're talking about Ethereum, how do you see this kind of moment? Hey now. <laughs> Adam. <laughs> sorry, sorry. I got... right off the top. <laughs> wow. Sheesh, a little sharp this morning, Adam. No, I do work for a mining company. So, you know, we got our opinions on ETH and ETH 2.0 and staking and all that stuff. But I'm actually an ETH fanboy. It's well known, I think, on this show. So I can dig into it. I do want to throw like a little cold water on this headline. I think that it's accurate and I think it's fair, but I do think there's a little nuance that we should definitely discuss when it comes to centralization on Ethereum. So yes, Lido and Coinbase were responsible for a lot of the blocks right out of the gate when Ethereum swapped from proof of work to proof of stake. But there's a few things in there that make this less of a concern in my opinion. First is that Lido itself has a large spectrum of users and it's part of a DAO and they have less control than Coinbase would over deciding how these transactions work, right? So there's a very large difference between a corporate firm based in San Francisco operating under US law and a DAO like Lido, which has its own infrastructure internally and its own ways of managing the stake. Uh, so that's, that's the first thing. Second thing is there's slashing penalties on top of this, right? So if there's some sort of conclusion or collusion, excuse me, there's ways to mitigate it, right? So proof of work and mining, if a pool starts acting up, starts centering transactions or whatever, you can just move your machine, point it somewhere else, and the pool will die. People stop using it. We're seeing that actively with Poolin right now, which is a Bitcoin mining company that might be insolvent, is at the very least having liquidity issues. We're still trying to figure out what's going on there. But what we have seen is a lot of Bitcoin miners have pointed their machines away from Poolin. Their hash rate has fallen by over 50%. And that is basically like a very real world effect for you not operating your company well. Same thing could happen with Coinbase or with Lido, right? Where if someone doesn't like how they work, well, they get slashed by the network. The last thing about that though, is we do not have the ability to withdraw funds from the network yeah so yes you could stake somewhere else possibly like change your staking process to a different client or perhaps a different service but it can get a little tricky right now because we don't have the ability to withdraw eth and we won't have that ability for like six to 12 months until there's another network change so yes i do think that this headline is very accurate i do think though you need to dig in a little bit more to say like oh should we be concerned right now i would say not something to be concerned about, but something to be aware of and start working towards fixing. And I think most of the developers are aware of this and are trying to build a different future where there's a little bit more fairness within client selection. Jen, I'll throw it to you. Well, I actually have two questions for you, Will. From a regulatory standpoint, when I read this story, I think, 
okay, should a regulator have a problem with Ethereum or with Ether, they can go after one of these centralized players pretty easily. And we've seen that happen with Tornado Cash. So from a regulatory standpoint, is this a concern we should have? And because of that, are we going to see more decentralized validators pop up um, you know, during the next little while? We certainly would like to see that, right? To the second question, we'd always want some sort of decentralized spectrum for these validators, but they're very hard to build, right? It's very difficult to build these things and the incentives are not often built into it, which gets into your first question, right? Are regulators going to like this? What they're often not going to like is one, transaction selection. So the fact that you can interact with an address, say a Tornado Cash address, they're not gonna want that. And so they'll probably put some push onto Coinbase or some sort of US entity that is doing that. We don't know that for a fact, but it's very with the. It could be in the realm of possibilities, right? The second part is uh, the stake token itself has been financialized with a token. So ETH has been put onto the ETH 2.0 chain, sitting there, and you get some rewards. Well, people wanted a little bit more than that, so they booted up these tokens. CB ETH is the one that Coinbase is using. Lido has a Lido token, and there's a few others out there. Basically, a token that represents your staked ETH, and it trades against that staked ETH, typically at a discount because there's some disadvantages to having it. That token is very much like a security in the sense that it has investments in it. It gets money. I'll throw it to you, Adam, in a second. It gets money from a token or it gets money from the project. And, you know, you can use it as some sort of investment contract. I would see like regulators look at this and be like, eh, why not regulate it? Uh, and it's oftentimes coming from a project like Coinbase, right? Like they're the ones issuing it. They didn't have to issue it. So I think that is where we're going to see some regulatory pressure. I'm not endorsing it, but I do think that's what's going to happen. 